Welcome to AP European History with Dr. Brovkin and Russian History with Dr. Brovkin. Today we continue our conversation about the shameful pages of history. In my last video, I focused on the United States and the issue of slavery in today's America, but I also mentioned that there will be four more videos coming up in terms of how the shameful pages of history are dealt with in a number of countries and then today we're talking about Russia. As I mentioned many times before, the crucial question of Soviet history is Stalinism and the shameful period of history under Stalin, and of course, starting with Lenin, which is the Red Terror, the deportations, the dekulakization, the dekazakization, de uh, the uh, murder of uh, peasants in Ukraine, the Great Terror, the, under Stalin, the state, the purges, the show trials, all, all this stuff, deportations of peoples. As I mentioned before, the crimes of Stalin era are endless and they affected millions and millions of people. So the question is, how do the Russians deal with it? How they have dealt with it and how they could justify or explain or deal with it morally now when you had such a bloody history? That is the question. Now, I would say, to put this very complex and huge topic in, in a matter of minutes, I would focus on four major stages of how the Soviet people and then Russian people dealt with it over time. And of course, it would be much simplified because it, it's a huge topic. One could talk about years and hundreds of books are written about it now, so it's very difficult to summarize it all in, in a few minutes. But I'll try. The first stage was Khrushchev, uh, the general secretary Khrushchev, who came to power shortly after Stalin in 1953, and he stayed in power until 1964, when he was removed by his colleagues from power. This period is called officially de-Stalinization. So what it actually amounted to? It amounted to two things. Uh, the centerpiece of it was his speech at this so-called secret speech at the 20th Party Congress in 1956, and then another one in 1961 at a 22nd Party Congress when he admitted that there were, quote, repressions, and there was, he put an emphasis on the party, that there were innocent party officials who were repressed, arrested, shot, executed, uh, dealt with in, a, in a, um, illegal ways. Uh, and that was the major, major focus. Now, um, among other good things was the second prong of this policy was the so-called thaw in literature. And this was when memoirs by some people were allowed to be written, when uh, Solzhenitsyn published his uh, first novel, uh, One Day in the, in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, which described the life in the gulag. And, and the whole idea of a gulag and camps uh, began to be publicly discussed in a very limited way because the speech was not published, it was secretly delivered to the party congress, it was all very limited. The main upshot of this was the awakening of this of society and intellectuals to this topic, even though the party wanted to hush it up. And this is the crucial moment. The party wanted to hush it up because the question would be, what did you do at that time? Was there any your personal guilt? What did Khrushchev do? What did Brezhnev do? Did they know about what was going on? And if they did, why they were silent? And did they participate themselves? And they did. So this is why it raised the issue of responsibility, legitimacy, and um, what to do about it at the current time. So all that stopped, and that brings us to the second period, which is under Brezhnev. In 1964, Khrushchev was removed from power, and all conversations about the crimes of the Stalin era were stopped. It was pretty much a taboo. This is the 20 years when you cannot talk about Stalin crimes. If you did, the KGB is going to come and get you and put you in jail under Article 58, spreading of anti-Soviet propaganda. Uh, so it really became a very, very tough and very repressive regime where it became a banned topic. Can't talk about it. If you do, you're going to suffer. 20 years of silence, that's the second period. The third period comes under Gorbachev, and that is 1985, and it lasts into the 1990s uh, where the different situation would arise. Now, this is the one where, indeed, it became a mass topic of discussion. In fact, 
it becomes number one on the political agenda. The crimes of the Stalin era. This is the explosion of activity, the explosion of societies, discussion groups, publications. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands of memoirs appear and the articles in the newspapers. And this becomes a, a, an agenda. Who is to blame? Who committed these crimes? Have they ever been tried? Who is responsible? And the more it went on, the more it became apparent to the, to the Soviet people, to the Russians, that it's the party who is responsible. Now, the exact opposite of what Khrushchev was saying. Khrushchev was saying the party was an innocent victim. Well, the discussion on the Gorbachev actually boiled down to the party was a criminal organization that assisted uh, to Stalin in this horrendous system of repression and crime and murder. And that, of course, discredited the party. And exactly what happened was what the communists were most afraid of. And that is that they would become uh, guilty in the national consciousness of uh, assisting and being the perpetrators of the crimes against so many people. So it discredited the Communist Party, it discredited the, the political system of Soviet communism, and it discredited the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. So in that sense, it prepared the collapse of uh, 1991 and the removal of Gorbachev, the collapse of the system, and brings us to uh, period number four, 1990s. Now, before I talk about 1990s, let's make absolutely clear, shameful pages of history doomed the Soviet system and the Soviet Union. It was a direct result. This collapse of the regime was a consequence of the fact that the Russian people learned the truth about what happened in the past. 1990s is a very strange period of Russian history. As I mentioned in many of my other videos, it's probably the worst period other than Stalin's crimes. But it was not a outward repression. It was not the government uh, as much as it was the oligarchs and the criminal gangs and the corruption and the lawlessness and the collapse of the currency and poverty and, and many, many other horrible things. If you're interested, you should watch my videos on the 1990s. But this topic we're talking about now, the crimes of the Stalin era, it kind of recedes to the background because people are so busy with just trying to survive, just trying to get by, earn a few rubles to, to, to buy food. This is the mass poverty and dislocation of the 1990s. And finally, we come to the next period, which is uh, Putin's uh, period, when President Putin is in power, and that is uh, uh, you know, from 1999 to the present. And here's the situation as it evolved in these years. Number one, uh, crimes of the Stalin era are not a taboo. Uh, you can talk about it, and they do talk about it. Moreover, Putin and the government itself admits publicly that these were crimes, uh, that this is something that has to be condemned and something that has to be uh, shown in the full ugliness of the truth of the matter. So this is the time when you have today uh, the Memorial Society, which collects a testimony for private individuals and families. You have a Gulag uh, Museum, which also has seminars and educational um, materials and conferences and videos and a huge library that they assembled. So they are legal. They they kind of a, they are a part of today's kind of repentance over uh, the. Um, uh, the crimes of the Stalin era. Hundreds of publications. Uh, and another thing uh, that is a part of this movement is a return to the old names. All the discredited communist leaders just were uh, names were changed, like uh, Sverdlovsk is now Yekaterinburg, Leningrad is now St. Petersburg, and the list goes on and on and on. The, the old pre revolutionary names. Uh, and, of course, the monuments to Stalin were removed and overthrown. A famous moment in 1991 that the monument to Dzerzhinsky, the Cheka chief, was overthrown, turned down uh, in uh, Moscow. So there's a kind of a definitely uh, a, a putting, dealing with uh, Stalinist crimes and with the whole Bolshevik experience in a way that shows there was a significant revision 
uh, significant awakening to the fact that horrible things happened under the communist regime, uh, uh, under Lenin and Stalin. However, uh, if you look at the public opinion polls uh, on the matter, and this is all available for those of you listeners who are interested, uh, on the website of, of CIOM, which is an uh, all-Russian um, center for the study of public opinion, uh, they show that 72% of Russians today would like to know more about the Stalinist crimes. Uh, 68% believe that they were unnecessary and they were criminal and they should be uh, uh, not forgotten and definitely uh, more should be investigated. But 40% of people in today's Russia believe that they were necessary to keep law and order. Uh, and this is the kind of a very interesting indicator that the society is split over those who want to go full steam ahead and uh, reveal everything that could be and should be known about those crimes. And those who say, well, yes, the, the, there were some excesses, as they said, but uh, it was necessary to keep the country together. And there were real enemies and they had to be dealt with. Uh, and there were real people who hated the Soviet system and they had to be dealt with. So this is a kind of an interesting uh, balance in today's Russia. Uh, and that shows very, very in symbolic features, such as uh, the city of Leningrad, as we all know, was changed into St. Petersburg. And as a person who was born in this city, I can tell you that all the streets, just dozens and dozens of streets that had anything to do with communists uh, and revolution and those, you know, murderers of the Tsar who, who were, uh, whose uh, names were used to name the streets, uh, that, that they killed Alexander II. All that is gone. Uh, all the names in St. Petersburg were, were returned to, this, to the uh, names they had before 1917. So the kind of definite de rejection of the Soviet experience and Soviet uh, symbol. On the other hand, the province is still is called uh, Leningrad province. And if you want to take a train from Moscow to St. Petersburg, it's not going to be the railway station is called Leningrad station uh, and uh, not the Petersburg station uh, and so on and so forth. The monuments to Lenin are still there. And, and this is perhaps the most interesting symbolism of the current compromise. Uh, uh, yes, you know, the Tsarist family was killed in uh, Yekaterinburg. Uh, that was called Sverdlovsk. Those of you who don't know, Sverdlov was uh, number one uh, man after Lenin in 1918. He was his closest associate. He was involved in the murder of the Tsar and Lenin too. So in that sense, you have the city named of the Sverdlov, Sverdlovsk, the murderer of the Tsar. And in the city of Sverdlovsk, there's a monument to Lenin and there's a main street that's called Lenin Street. And the monument to Lenin is still standing there. However, the city was name was changed back to the original Yekaterinburg, but the province stayed Sverdlovsk province. But another thing that this kind of compromise is that uh, the Tsar and his family were canonized, and there's this huge movement in Russia of uh, rediscovering the Tsar and, and a very positive attitude to the Tsar now. Uh, and then, of course, there's this beautiful cathedral that, that, that they built in the middle of Yekaterinburg with a monument to the Tsar and, and the Tsarist family killed by the Bolsheviks. Uh, and there's a kind of a definite uh, resurgence of interest and uh, repentance and forgiveness, especially, especially among the religious Russians. But the compromise in this kind of a balance is in the fact that on the one hand, you have a monument to Lenin and Lenin Street in Yekaterinburg today, and a few blocks over, uh, you have a huge, beautiful cathedral uh, as a memorial to the Tsar and a monument to the Tsar killed by Lenin and by Sverdlov. So th this is a very, very symbolic thing. The same thing in Moscow. You still have a mausoleum of Lenin and the conversation keeps on going whether to remove him, whether not to remove him. Uh, and, and it just never ends. But Lenin is still there. 
However, I would say that uh, as a final word that in today's Russia, Stalin is not a hero. It, 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 Stalin is, is, people prefer not to talk about it because it's something that brings uh, negative connotations and uh, feelings of guilt. In one of the recent discussions uh, on the subject uh, in Salavyov, uh, show, very popular TV show where in, in, intellectuals discuss current affairs, uh, they were talking about the feeling of guilt and whether Russians should experience it. And, and many of the speakers said, no, we shouldn't. Why should we feel guilty about something that was done so, so many years ago by those people who we had no control over? Uh, so, so there's a very interesting conversation, whether feeling guilty uh, and very repentance should be experienced not just by the religious people, by the Russian society as large. And final word is that memory of the shameful pages of history kind of recedes in modern Russia. Uh, and what is taking place is, is the uh, accentuation of the victory in World War II. So what you could see uh, is uh, on the 9th of May every year is this huge movement of people uh, which is uh, called uh, which is called uh, uh, immortal regiment and thousands and tens of thousands of people are carrying placards with those uh, members of their family fallen in World War II but there are no portraits of Stalin there's no mention that Stalin was the leader that actually was had something to do with this victory because it was he was the commander in chief. In any case, Stalin is not there, but the memory of the people who had fallen uh, is there. On the other hand, you do not see these kind of processions with portraits of people who fell victim of Stalinist terror. That that's just not happening. So, in a sense, you kind of have a national replacement in the memory of the victims of the Stalin era that are there. They're acknowledged. They're they're not denied that they happen, but at the same time, the national memory chooses to focus on the positive, and the positive is the victory on, in World War II. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you in another video on the shameful topics of history.